Hello, my name is Pete Saronis, and I am honored here to uh, moderate yet another wonderful episode of Industry Insights. This is number 23, and our guests today are Joe Ortiz, Ron Kroska, and Kevin Corcoran. You're going to hear about them in a minute. Wonderful thought leaders, amazing storytellers, and I can't wait for you all to walk away in an hour and, and have your, your brain not cramping, but excited to learn more. Uh, I was the former CTO for Department of Energy, so this topic is of, of a very keen interest to me, utility-driven solutions. Uh, we're going to talk about everything from smart grid to smart communications. We're going to talk about operational efficiencies, and we hope you come away a bit more educated, informed, and enlightened, which are the verbs I like when it comes to a topic like this. And Carex, uh, a wonderful company that's convened and is celebrating, or we are celebrating this week, the uh, Anterix Active Ecosystem Program, of which these individuals and those that you uh, have been hearing about, um, coming together and moving the needle collaboratively is what we need in a world that's just dominated with so much technology, so much concern about critical infrastructure, and the need for more resilient infrastructure and communications uh, on our planet. And uh, I'm just super excited. So a little bit of bragging about these fellas. Uh, Ron is with Hitachi Energy. He's the director. Grid automation is one of his subject matter expertise areas among many. Uh, Ron is also a Marquette University graduate. I'm a Big East guy, Villanova. So uh, we are not frenemies, but uh, I wish they would have pulled it out and gone a little bit further in the tournament this year. So it's great to see you there, Ron. Good to see you, Pete. Yeah, man. Uh, then we've got Kevin Corcoran, Senior Director, Product Management. Okay, folks, Hubble Power Systems and Aclara, Aclara, which is a division of Hubble Power Systems. We'll get into that when Kevin explains it, but uh, what a title. And UVA guy that he is, uh, love the ACC, being a Maryland guy growing up, uh, the Terps and the Cavs went at it. So good to see you, Kevin. Thanks. Good to All see right. You. Yeah, man. And then, of course, Joe Ortiz hails from uh, the wonderful state of Florida when it comes to education. I'm a big Miami fan. He's got unbelievable pedigrees, two bachelor degrees in science, electrical engineering and applied physics. Uh, he's got a certified Six Sigma black belt. Oh, and he's also general manager for Ubiquia, who we'll hear a lot about. So we're excited to have Joe as well. And I think just based on what I've conveyed, and if you've Googled these folks, you'll see that they've had amazing journeys and this is something they're passionate about. So, welcome, Joe. My man, the you, the you. Okay, uh, plus I'm a Dolphins fan, so Miami Dolphins. Um, all right, we're gonna start with Ron. Ron, a little bit about yourself so the audience can feel humanized or you humanize yourself on, on your journey, uh, what you do at, at Hitachi and why it's such a passionate topic for you. Sure. Thanks, Pete. A um, little bit of background of myself. Historically, I've, I've kind of come into the utility space from this world of mobile devices. And one of the things that I really learned as the mobile device and cellular ecosystem evolved was the importance of a connected device and all the capabilities we could unleash both from a user experience perspective, and if you draw an analogy to the utility world, I think of that in terms of control, but also in terms of you know monitoring capabilities, right? I mean, in the mobile device world, we, we, we tended to think of things in terms of hygiene here, we think of it in terms of situational awareness, monitoring. So I spent a lot of years in the mobile world, uh, very familiar with cellular technology, Dating myself started with AMPS and all, all the way up through CDMA and into LTE. And about seven years ago, decided, you know, there was another industry that had a lot of high level parallels. The specifics were very different, um, but moved into uh, the utility space and grid modernization and grid automation in particular. And, you know, with that, saw the possibilities and continue to see the possibilities of what we can do with the connected utility. So transitioning into my role at Hitachi Energy, what we focus on really is, and we've got a we've got a lot of high voltage equipment, transformers, grid integration. So the big gray things that you see across the uh, the the grid, both on the transmission and distribution side. But we also have a function where I specifically reside, which is called grid automation. So looking at all the things that we needed to do to modernize the grid 
And a big part of that, and I'll start with, you know, what my, my main day-to-day -day responsibility is looking after the wireless part of our portfolio. So in that space, we, we look at things like different technologies and it's hard to believe it's been two years since the Enteric Active Ecosystem was launched, but a big part of our portfolio is now having what we call our Tiro 600 series of products, which are user equipment devices. So we're not a player in the, the RAM core, the high level network infrastructure business, but we see it's critically important to grid modernization to have an enabler and the key enabler is that communication network and we provide an edge device. But then for this particular panel, we'll also spend a fair amount of time talking about some of the higher level solutions or automation capabilities that, that Hitachi Energy provides to deliver solutions to the marketplace. So kind of from a tradition standpoint, fault management is a key area that we, we've got a number of software and hardware based solutions there. Renewable integration, right? So fault management has historically been where most of the distribution automation investments have been. But as we start to see more and more renewables, how those renewables integrate into the grid is an important part of our portfolio, including things like volt bar management optimization. And then finally, again, tie, closing the loop and tying it back to some of the things that we did in the mobile world, something we call intelligent infrastructure monitoring. So the ability to provide better hygiene, better insight, better situ aware, situational awareness of how the grid works. So hopefully that wasn't too long-winded, but a little bit of background. What what I, how we got to this space and a little bit more about what Hitachi Energy provides to the marketplace. Well, first of all, it was wonderful. And, and for, for Joe and Kevin, that's kind of what we're looking for, right? I mean, you, you gave a, a little bit, we'll get into some of it and, and I'm just gonna do what I do. I mean, first of all, the journey that you've had, which again, I'm 56 and I go back to the days of pre-internet. I was at the DOD when the internet was being invented. So uh, I went to school in the mid nineties and, uh, IP telephony at some point was the thing, and people were like, heck no, no way. Uh, but the the reference to cellular and CDMA and of grid modernization, the complexity uh, you, you spoke to without saying the sky is falling and it's never going to happen, but I love the situational awareness. Ron, I hear that over and over about, it's not so much about putting new tech and IoT devices into the grid and oh man, we're going to have another colonial. It's we need real-time information to save lives. And I love that you said situational awareness if done in the right manner, and we'll get into that. Man, we have the information at our fingertips. So awesome job. Let's go, Joe. Joe Ortiz, follow Mr. Ron. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Joe Ortiz. Currently, I'm the general manager at Ubiquia. I did go to the University of Miami for undergrad. And I spent the bulk of my career at a large utility where I really focused on reliability for 25 years. It was to me very interesting to learn how little involvement we've had in the grid as far as technology. And so for me, the opportunity is really the integration of the grid with technology, blending the two together to give that situational awareness that Ron was talking about so that the folks that are keeping the lights on can make the right bit of information available to the decision makers at the right time, at the right place, right? So, you know, to that end, we joined um, Ubiquiti's building intelligent infrastructure, right? Their platforms install in minutes, they make the world easier to operate, more connected. And really they have a fleet of, uh, of solutions that they provide around smart city, around grid, and around communications, all of which use existing infrastructure to leverage the technology being integrated to the grid. And so what I look to do, you know, kind of my, my goal here is really to educate folks on how to really bring in technology that's new, novel, right? The iPhone, kind of Ron's analogy here, um, to the grid devices that have not really changed over the last hundred years. And so I think we'll talk a little bit about situational awareness. We'll talk a lot about reducing O&M costs. We'll talk a lot about improving reliability. Joe, I loved it. So here's what I took away 
first of all, you, you hit on this reliability for 25 years, which people say reliability, they go, that same thing as resilience a lot of times. No, it's not. The grid needs to be up and sometimes it's down and we hope it's as reliable. Resilience, which we know is a big part of the bipartisan infrastructure law and critical infrastructure is now a term we talk about. Um, and it's not just utility and energy, right? It's manufacturing, defense, industrial, but resilience is one of the hottest words here inside of Washington. And we hope people understand that difference, but thank you for, for emphasizing that. Right place, right time, absolutely. Real-time information, streaming information. How do we make sense of all this raw data and turn it into something that provides that situational awareness. Love that we're gonna get into that and the value proposition of you and your companies doing it. Intelligent infrastructure, folks, Joe said it, intelligent infrastructure is what we're trying to get to and we hope and pray that it's it's truly intelligent for their greater good. But yes, there are risks, but there's also uh, the art of the possible. And I think we're all hopefully understanding on this talk today, it's not about tech, you plug it in and it works. Some of Ron's points and Joe emphasized a smart, City, big fan of it, by the way. Think of it simply as not something that you just turn on. It is an ecosystem of the communications, the planes, the trains, the cars. Google it, embrace it, but one day we hope that our cities are smarter because smart people helped architect it. So Joe, we're gonna get into that. And I know we just did a thing with the city of Coral Gables um, and just highlighted the, the wonderful work down there. So food for thought. Um, all right, Mr. Corcoran, KC. Who are you and why are you so passionate about this topic? Great, thank you, Pete. Um, uh, similar to Ron, I actually uh, got here by way of uh, the tele telecommunications and networking industry in the earlier part of my career. Um, and then back in the days of the early uh, smart grid, uh, even you know, including projects uh, like the original smart grid city project that Excel Energy did out in Boulder, uh, previous uh, company I was with and previous role was part of that and, and you know back in the previous round of, of government stimulus that really got a lot of you know what we were calling smart grid back then the ARA ARRA Act that really um, juiced up a lot of the early smart metering projects companies I was with uh, previously were involved in that uh, and a lot of that was really in uh, centered around adding different forms of, of uh, broadband communications to the networks. I mean, there was uh, utilities using cellular, certainly. Uh, we were doing some things with broadband power line communications. We were working with other partners at the time that were centered on WiMAX. So uh, it's exciting to see how that just has continued and, and grown over the years. Um, that was part of, of Hubble, uh, the Hubble Utility Solutions uh, Division. Um, We've got a variety of different solutions, both traditional infrastructure as well as smart infrastructure. And my role continues to be with, uh, under the Eclara uh, subdivision of, of Hubble Utility Solutions, uh, Eclara Smart Sensing Solutions. And it's the, it's the devices, it's the communications, it's the software, uh, and enabling those solutions of, of you know, how you can use them or different types of use cases and applications that you guys have all been talking about. Uh, then being able to also have roles with some of the traditional infrastructure, we're talking with customers more and more about how they can add communications to some more traditional pieces of equipment and then the benefits that they, they get with that. So you guys talked about you know, Volt VAR and, and CVR applications. Uh, I think we'll get into some of the um, automation for uh, reliability applications, things like Flisser. But uh, so in my role, I, I get a chance to, to work with you know, customers on some of those applications to help improve the, the reliability, resiliency, and grid efficiency, uh, and, and also helping to enable a lot of clean energy solutions that are priority for a lot of our customers. I love it, Kevin, and uh, if I may, just before we get into kind of diving a little into each of your respective, you know, roles, and I, I hope you do this, you know, and you each work for different companies, um, you know, this is not the competitive frenemy discussion, right? It's a village, and each of you are focused on certain things. Kevin, you hit on uh, a number of topics that, yes, I go back to the ARA funding myself, and the ARA funding was like uh, $4.3 billion for smart grid, for smart 
uh, this, that, or the other. And I remember that in 2008. And I was like, oh, this is way cool. And people were like, not in my backyard. So I love that journey from being a tele, well, being a telecom guy and then doing some great work with Excel in your history. Um, the disparate infrastructure, you talked about the traditional and the modern. For our audience today, there is no quick fix. There is no silver bullet. When you hear, uh, oh, there's a smart traffic light or there's LIDAR on a car, that doesn't happen overnight. There is the, once we collect information, is it at integrity and provenance built into it? So again, from sensing to grid comms to automation, no doubt technology is not the problem. I think that's that human component, the integration, the teaching others, traditional grid operators in many cases, how these new tools can hopefully you know, help them do their jobs more efficiently. So uh, we will get into and feel free just so I can put it out there now that everybody's introduced themselves. Uh, there's a lot of material on this topic, folks. The NIST framework and roadmap for smart grid interoperability standards release 4.0. It was developed with government and folks who have domains in the utility, vendor, equipment manufacturer, renewable power producer, retail service provider, and regulators perspective. Lots you can learn on by searching that document, the NIST framework and roadmap. There's an 1800-32A 1800-32A NIST special publication, and Terex was a part of the CRADA, oh, by the way, on securing the industrial internet of things from a cybersecurity and distributed energy resource. And just as I like things in three, uh, in March of this year, NIST researchers are informing the development of standards for smart grid sensors. These gentlemen are in that space already, but this is where government, industry, and academia are coming together to really investigate the promise of, of a smarter world that we will live in. Okay, Ron, um, I've looked at some of our questions and, and really what I like to start with in this segment is for, for, for Joe and Kevin. So Ron's gonna set the bar. Um, there's so many challenges and opportunities and impacts uh, that, that a smart grid or automation can provide. Can you use an example or a use case or just speak to in general this uh, what's the conversation been like in the AAEP with the folks you talk to, recognizing there's late adoption and early adoption, but utilities are unique. They're the operational technology of the OTIT integration. How and what maybe specifically are you excited about when it comes to the utilities maybe uh, saying, hey, I'm all in because I want that resiliency? Yeah, the, the way I see it when we have these conversations at the, at the highest level, what are the biggest challenges that they face? And we could spend hours on these four oh, yeah. But Just to, to give you an idea, first and foremost is getting network visibility to have a better understanding of, again, situ, situational awareness of the device, be able to create outage management. And that's pretty traditional capabilities. So in, in that, and obviously tying it back to the Enteric's active ecosystem and some of the things that we have, right? That's step one. Step one is all about having a connected utility that you can provide quick, open, interoperable, standards-based solutions to provide connectivity to these edge sensing devices. They don't have to be on the edge, but that's number one. So once we get past that, then it opens up a whole plethora of different opportunities in terms of things that we can go after and look at. So that's step one, and again, from a, an individual that comes from a communications background, really excited to see that as taking hold is fundamentally uh, a key and core part of, of the industry. And having said that, I, I will say in the industry, IT and OT are quite honestly still figuring out how to work well together, right? Um, so different utilities have different approaches on how they how they want to roll out these networks and i think one of the one of the roles in addition to the solutions that we provide is bridging that gap where necessary some places are completely collaborative other places we need to bridge gaps so that's number one the second one is and it's related to once you have visibility into the asset you can start getting into a resiliency and ability to recover from some sort of failure in your network, right? Whether it's based on control or, or purely based on monitoring. And again, I think it's all about optimizing the scarce resources that are there in the utility to do that. And then the, the third is making sure that, again, in, in situ, situational awareness becomes a big part of this, understanding the reliability, the potential failure points of an not only an aging infrastructure 
but a workforce that's about to turn over. A case in point, one of the things I was at a, a utility not too long ago who I think there are about 200 individuals and I, I applaud them. They, they received a early pension offer that they could not afford to refuse. But you know, one of the challenges that it created for the organization, they lost about 600 staff years of institutional knowledge. Now, some of that is documented and backed up, but I think it, it sets the stage for how do we start getting better information so that when you have this shift crew change and you know, not only is it reliability of the infrastructure, it's reliability of how you maintain the grid and optimize the grid is an important part of that. So I think collectively the grid automation space enabled by communications helps to solve the reliability problem as well as the institutional knowledge gaps that may be created when individuals leave. And then the last point I'll leave us with now, and again, I don't, I don't wanna go on too long about this, but really the other key part in this is where government funding is coming in with the IRA Act is, you know, the, the penetration of distributed energy, renewables is an important part of the grid. And we're starting to see um, needs for how do we handle two-way power flow far better than we historically have, because it's becoming a more and more important part of the operational profile. So there's things on the operational side in terms of control, but then there's also additional insights that are needed in terms of how are our assets performing thing time of day is going to become more important in terms of monitoring what an asset looks like so you know at, at a high level those are some of the four of the top challenges that i see when i talk to some of the key customers and folks that are in the in the operation space both on the transmission side and the distribution side well you set the table ron and again as i get ready to pivot to joe and then kevin you know again same question but feel free to say hey you know building off that because so much was put out there for our audience network visibility standardization outage management edge devices the itot figuring each other out bridging gaps yes my most excitable moment in your in your opening or in those remarks were you talked about aging infrastructure i'm 56 we got an aging workforce and people have a, they're human beings. I know people who are grid operators that are like, I don't want to lose my job. And there's, that's a tough, like, well, AI is here to stay and automation is here, but the human brain, I've been told by my friends at the Department of Energy, it's just the most powerful computer on earth. We still haven't figured it out. Human ingenuity and expertise for a workforce that might be aging can also turn into we need it to reskill, retain, and recruit the future generation. So for anybody watching this, no one's pushing you out of a job. Just you do got to bone up on some of this to know how that knowledge and wisdom can translate with technology. So thank you, Ron. That was amazing. Joe, comments? Ron, Ron hit on a lot of the big points, right? Um, so, so I'll just, I'm going to build on it, like you said. Uh, but I do agree that that grid situational awareness is key to, to what the utilities are doing. Um, I'll take a step back and say the the visionary within the grid has to be there. There has to be leadership and a thorough understanding of a sound deployment strategy. And like it or not, with, with all of that comes an ROI strategy, right? They're not just going to deploy millions, billions of dollars without some sort of return on investment. And so you have to strategically think about how you're going to go about all that. So is asset management important? Absolutely. Why? Because of all the things Ron said and extreme weather, aging infrastructure, uh, asset management that traditionally hasn't been applied in, uh, in quite uh, high fidelity or accuracy in the distribution side of the house. So that distribution grid that really brings power to the homes and, and it's kind of like the last mile of power has traditionally always been treated as a disposable commodity, right? We've got lots of it. It's readily available, easy to deploy, you know, so, so, you know, not a big deal until COVID, until supply chain, until the, you know, lead times for, for equipment goes from 12 weeks to two years until the price starts to increase from you know something that is nominal you know a couple thousand bucks to 15 20,000 
for a distribution transformer. All of these things really hit home is, as far as the business side of the utility. And so when you're thinking about smart grid deployment, you got to think to yourself, where am I going to be able to deploy intelligence on the grid so that I can get a good ROI? Where, am I, where should I be deploying it so that I'm targeting areas that are actionable and I'm not just deploying sensors for the sake of deploying sensors? I want to be able to do something. I want to be able to show my key stakeholders that I'm reducing O&M expenses, I'm improving the reliability of the grid, I'm being proactive where I can be proactive. So, so from my perspective, really understanding where those key points in the grid where outages are coming from and doing something to gain that informational and situational awareness is key for us. That, that's where I think the biggest opportunity is, is deployment ROI and 100% agree. You know, we're looking at extreme weather events. We're looking at aging infrastructure. We're looking at uh, a high retirement rate. And all of that is being pinned up against supply chain issues, uh, limited supply. A lot of the equipment that's being built and used in the utility space is also now being, it has increased pressure on it from the EV space or from the distributed generation space. So all these efforts for, for the, the, the green energy deployment are putting traditional utility deployment efforts um, kind of sometimes at war with each other. And, and if we don't understand and balance those needs, you know, one is gonna be impacted by the other in many of those, you know, either supply chain, aging infrastructure, or aging workforce. I'll just cut it like that. No, Joe, I love it. And I, I wrote down some awesome stuff here, uh, you know, building off Ron and, and Joe and then and we'll hit Kevin here in a minute. Leadership, situational awareness, the conversations that have to happen, the vision. These are discussions I sit in and sometimes it's just, gosh, can we just get to agree that we have aging infrastructure? We have a workforce and that technology is not here to replace. So. I love, uh, you know, show me a person without a plan, I'll show you a person who plans to fail. There has to be strategy, it must be tactical and operational if we're gonna have success. ROI, 100%. Look, stuff costs money, but the promise of, and that's the, the potential, like there's challenges. We saw what happened in Texas, we saw, I mean, the list goes on. We, when Katrina hit, when, you know, uh, we, we had Superstorm Sandy, when we had tornadoes, people are dying. And that's when we usually find out where our infrastructure needed to be a bit more fortified, possibly. Uh, I've been to New Orleans, you know, I've, been, I've seen the aftermath, like we all have on pictures, but being there and going, oh my gosh, how did they not know? Well, technology, remember the uh, tsunami? Buoys now have sensors in parts of the ocean to forewarn people when they say, why is it receding like that? So this, this power of technology, I, I hope, is something that be, can be seen as being proactive can help save lives and and that all comes back to strategy but yes there's an investment but there's the opportunity and thank you and let's listen just to get get ron ready i want to talk about some of your companies and some of the excitement you have about capabilities the application of whether it's a sensor or some new analytics to save lives in the future but getting to kevin kevin riffing off our our, our colleagues here joe and ron talk to us a little bit about you know what they've been hitting on in terms of just how do we turn you know, challenges into those incredible opportunities? Certainly. Um, uh, Ron and, and Joe both uh, made some excellent points. Um, you know, for me, a lot of times I talk about uh, visibility, uh, but also if we're talking about you know, adding uh, robust real-time communications that enables control, is to do a lot of you know, great uh, updates and, and modernization of the infrastructure. And you talked about aging infrastructure, aging workforce, and, and using some of the, the new, new tools and technologies, it's exciting stuff. I mean, this is, this is a fun time to be involved in utility space. You know, back when I was in school, I had the option of, of doing a power electronics or, or a computer uh, engineering degree. I went for that. And uh, now, you know, when I got back into the utility space, I had to, you know, relearn all the power electronic stuff, but it's, it's come together now with uh, some of the, the grid modernization solutions. 
Um, and it, it's not just that the tools are going to replace people. Uh, you still need the, the intelligent you know, team members and utilities to figure out how best to apply some of these new tools. It's not like you know, anybody can just do this. You need people that understand what they're trying to accomplish. And, and you know, we all bring some tools that, as, as everybody mentioned, have to be interoperable to, to achieve some of the greater uh, objectives for, uh, for our customers. Um, and, and different utilities are going to be at different points on the journey. Uh, I'm sure some of the, the audience today, you know, maybe looking just to get started with, you know, adding more communications to get the better visibility and situation awareness of their, of their networks. Other, other people that have joined us today may have already, you know, gone through some of those steps and they're taking some more uh, advanced um, you know, measures of, of adding more automation to their network um, and getting into more proactive and preventative uh, measures and, and taking disparate sources of data throughout their, their network from the, the meters, including smart chargers that are going to be coming for the EVs all the way up to their substation and, and doing a much greater amount of, of uh, data analytics to help them um, operate the network you know, more reliably, more resilient and, and, and in a more optimized fashion. So, Kevin, to close out, and again, thank you again. Everybody's building off everyone so wonderfully. This, the word visibility, uh, uh, interoperability, a maturity model, you nailed it. There are a lot of utilities. Folks, there's not like three. Not everybody's an IOU. The munis, the co-ops, the smallers that don't have the funding. I mean, it's one grid, right? Fellas, it's one powerful grid that keeps the lights on. Some utilities have more money than others. That's when we have to look at we're as strong as the weakest link, my two cents. And I think that's where we have to look at ROI for the greater good. But at the end of the day, you got to take care of your customers, but you also need to recognize there's a part of our country, a big part coming from energy. Just go talk to the power marketing administrations, Bonneville Power, Western Area, Southeast and, and, and Swapa, where it's rural. There are places that don't even have internet access in our country. So we're a little spoiled in certain uh, you know, metropolitan areas, but thank you for bringing that up. So as we pivot now into, let's talk a little bit about the awesomeness of Ubiquia. Let's talk about what Hubble's excited about. You know, it's kind of that, what's on your roadmap and what are some of the applications of this smart communication so folks can walk away going, thank God those, those folks and those companies are, are addressing it. But before we get there, so you can get your, your neurons firing, Folks, the United States Department of Homeland Security issued the Binding Operational Directive 23-01 to improve asset visibility and vulnerability to, to, to asset, sorry, visibility and vulnerability detection in federal networks. You can replace federal networks with we still need to do that at our utility. The continuous and comprehensive asset visibility is something that we have to do when we deploy sensors. It affords us that opportunity to save a life if a falling line conductor happens? Do we need private you know, LTE to control and then have a redundant backhaul network on the carriers? This is the beauty. You gotta know what you have, to Ron's point and the fellas, before you know what you need to monitor. So I just wanna emphasize that. That's our Department of Homeland Security where all of the governance and policy around critical infrastructure generally emanates from. So. Thank you for that that uh, that segment. All right, so Ron, let's talk Hitachi Energy and some excitement happening in your world. Sounds good. For, before I dive into that, I want to comment on one of the points you made, Pete, earlier about um, getting individuals to evolve their work scope. And, and one of the things I will say in my observation is there is no shortage of opportunities at utilities, right? Um, you know, and we'll get into intelligent infrastructure monitoring but you know there's a huge opex reduction in a capability where you don't really need an individual to drive around and take readings from the assets that need to be monitored i'd much rather have that individual doing something like monitoring the analytic solution understanding what to alarm and where to take action in the network so i think you know as part of and, and i think that does twofold right it keeps people's individuals fresh. And I also think that mentality will treat and enable a higher tech uh, new grad community to come into the utility workforce, right? As I look around, you know, I've worked with a lot of 
the, the pace in our industry is not the same as the pace in the, an internet-based company or in a mobile devices-based company. So I think there's steps that we need to take collectively as an industry. And again, I apologize for the tangent, but I think it's important to get this point out there to bring in more diverse talent across the board. And, and a lot of things that we'll talk about now, we'll get into that. So I'll get off my soapbox for the min minute there. And no soapbox, the buddy. Listen, workforce development, a tenant for a, for a future state. So thank you for emphasizing it. Sorry for yeah. jumping in. Yeah, no worries. So, so now I'll get back to the question that you really asked me. Um, can, so I, can I build on that? Sorry, Ron. So, yeah. so I'm I'm 100% with you. So, so you get into this either death spiral of doing work, you know, where you're playing whack-a-mole. You you go chase an outage. They go find the outage. They repair a thing, but they that's a symptom to the outage, right? They didn't understand what the true root cause was, right? It was a bunch of through faults. It was a tree hitting the line. It was some sort of outage. The symptom was a piece of equipment. And then we go and we chase that piece of equipment. And then sure enough, two weeks, two months later, another piece of equipment at that same feeder or substation fails. So we're in this constant like death spiral, sending more crews out there, chasing the, that next weak link in the chain, Pete, that you mentioned. But this is from a reliability perspective because we're chasing the symptoms. If we get the analytics out there, if we get the, the right data in the hands of the people that can look at it and go, oh, I see that I'm having a large number of faults, events, things at this location that are sub-cycle transient events that are not really causing a failure, but will lead to failures because they're treating the, the grid, uh, then you can become, you change that death spiral to that virtuous cycle, right? I now have data, I'm going out of, uh, and ahead of time looking for the outages, I'm looking for the tree branch that's hitting the line, I'm not waiting for the cable to fall, the outage to occur, or the transformer to fail. I'm getting ahead of those outages with the analytics. And I think that's the virtuous cycle, right? So instead of having people going out after the same, you know, event, cable, equipment failure, you can kind of take a step back with the analytics and to, to your both points is just kind of look at the whole grid from end to end and say, oh, this is what we need to tackle. Here's the true root cause. Let's get ahead of that so we're not putting excess wear and tear on the equipment based on these different events that we see happen. So I love it. That uh, folks, for the audience, this is why you really this is what a fireside chat is. It's really not now Jow, 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 Joe will get up and speak, or Kevin. We want to 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 understand, audience, that this is the collaborative community. This is why we have an AAP. This is why we have to have discussions. Kevin, do you want to comment on any of that? Because uh you know, Joe jumped in there and I was all for it. Are you good or you want to comment? No, I, I'm, I'm good. I, I think they made some great points. All right. Let's keep, let's keep rolling. Okay. So, Ron, let's come back to this, right? Given what you, 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 you folks humanized it, it's workforce development. Well, how do you do that? Analytics, data, AI, there's all these tools. What, what's Hitachi Energy? And frankly, again, in the spirit of the AAEP, I would imagine and feel free, it was 35 companies two years ago. It's over 100 today. Each brings something to the table and sharing those stories. So maybe talk a little bit about the power of community, but also emphasize, yes, here's something we're focused on. And if it's analytics, yes, but maybe there's an application or tool you're excited about. And then we'll hit each of you with that question. So, so I'll, I'll build up starting from a Anterix active ecosystem perspective, right? And again, none of this really takes off at all without a connected device. So first and foremost, from a Tachi Energy perspective, you know, the first enabler that we've got to have is a, a device in the field that can connect and communicate information coming back from the sensor. So within Hitachi, we've got a whole product portfolio. We call the TL 600 series of products that support not only Anterix, but their full cellular capable devices, right? And they're, they're designed to be, uh, deployed at the edges of the network within substations, all the critical points where you have sensing technology, right? And again, it's it's open, it's interoperable, it's 3GPP based, US band 8C now, and I guess it's gonna become band 142 sometime in the not too distant future uh, from an enterics perspective. But, you know, we see that as a key enabler, right? And, and once you have that enabler out there with the rest of the communication network, now you can start getting into the application discussions. So 
again, I, I'll think of it in terms of three key applications tying back to the common themes that we've had. So first is what we call generically fault management, whether it's fault detection, isolation, restoration, fault uh, flizzer uh, as well. All of those are about delivering improved quality to the end user, right? So if there is an outage, figure out if there's a way to route around that outage and recover service to as many folks as possible. And then the second piece of that is delivering better insights to the workforce crew that needs to go out and repair the fault, right? And what are some of the benefits that this solution delivers in our fault management portfolio? Really, from a uh, utility perspective, not only customer SAT, which is first and foremost, but also the operational metrics for both SATI and SAFI, right? So that's number one. And then the second one, and this gets more into, and, and historically that's been, in, in my opinion, I've been in this industry now for almost seven years. That's sort of been the traditional definition of distribution automation as far as I'm concerned, right? Getting that input, so the visibility to the assets and then making fault management type decisions. And I think now what we're starting to see is the evolution into renewable integration. And within Hitachi, we've got several solutions that deliver this and, you know, the, the end technology piece is really a transfer trip, right? The ability to disconnect the renewable from the rest of the grid delivers anti-islanding protection. So what does that mean? It means that if I lose power at a substation, I don't want a distributed energy resource pumping power back in while I'm trying to send a, a crew out there to repair that, right? So it's a safety issue. So we've got to deliver that. The other piece of this as well is as particularly as distributed energy grows and grows, we see more and more devices. We've got to monitor that we're not overloading the transformer. So if we do see over, transformer overload detection within the substation, we can jettison off or, or disable the connectivity from distributed energy resources. And I think the important part of delivering these type of transfer trip solutions really is having, and you'll see a common theme across Hitachi here, is a scalable and standards-based adaptable solution for DR penetration. In the industry, it's IE 61850, not trying to turn this into a uh, alphabet soup conversation, but it is important throughout this, and it's been my observation that as an industry, we've done really good at proprietary, and I think starting with Enterix and starting with some of the things that 61850 are doing, we're starting to deliver an open and interoperable ecosystem. And then the last thing, and this is getting to the crescendo of the intelligent uh, infrastructure monitoring and data analytics, you know, with two-way power flows, there's a lot more dynamics that are going on within the grid. I'll focus a little bit more on the substation, and this is where Hitachi's invested a significant amount of money and R&D resources to develop solutions to monitor those high-value assets. Not just monitoring in terms of traditional sense of distributed our, uh, DGAs, for example, but camera technology, thermal imaging technology, um, having the ability to then bring that information back so you can do one remote monitoring and then two remote inspection and then build upon that and, may, and automate both of those, both automate both inspection and autonomous. So from a, a utility perspective, what does it deliver? It delivers, um, again, great situational awareness, reduces operating expense, right? Which is a key part of how do you uh, optimize the utility spend. But then also it, from a, a workforce standpoint, it enables individuals to get more engaged in the running and the operations of the system, monitoring the analytics ecosystem to understand how assets are performing. And I think time of day is gonna become more and more important as more and more renewables and EV charging devices come in to understand how these assets are performing at various times of the day. And you know, then the, the last piece is obviously, you know, tying it and closing off with situational awareness once again, is all about making sure that we make better recommendations and Hitachi has a solution to recommend predictive or proactive maintenance associated with those assets. And that doesn't mean that you have to replace it all times. It may be better at some points to run to failure, but you also you, you know it's coming, right? So you can plan sure. for it. The, the worst situation you can have is an unplanned outage and you have to react to it, particularly in times like right now where we've got such a supply chain constraint. So very yeah. long-winded answer, but thanks for the, the opportunity. But I think it's important to lay out the different tiers of you know, how, how grid modernization and how all of this, how, how we can deliver better solutions to the market pace to optimize how the grid is, is, uh, is working. No, no, it's great. And I'm gonna come to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, um, 
you know, words like fault management, I mean, I think the complexity of the grid, you don't modernize it overnight. And that's why, shout out to Hitachi for, for, for leveraging, as, as Joe pointed out, analytics. Information is great once it has context around the data. Um, and by the way, no alphabet soup. That's why I did it. 61850, folks, go look it up. Google it. This is how we teach. But uh, Kevin, let, let's just go there. Like uh, what you're doing at Hubble and I'll... Uh, Forgive me. I'm an. Oh yes, a Clara. Like, what is some excitement around some of the capabilities that you've created to support that generation transmission distribution ecosystem? That is like it doesn't happen in one place. What are you excited about? What are you working on? Um, some of the the capabilities that that are available now, and we're working with our utility customers about um, just can help them with a wide variety of, of applications and you know as i mentioned earlier sometimes it's it's helping them at different points you know on the journey um some of the teams talked about um you know from reliability uh, perspective um you know it can be absolutely finding out you know uh, where the, the fault is so you can more quickly get people's lights on but as, as joe mentioned getting ahead of the curve is, is going to become more and more a capability and, and a requirement. Um, one place that is very interesting that we work with some of our customers on um, has to do with wildfire. You know, extreme you know, weather conditions are, are absolutely a, a big thing for a lot of utilities. Not everybody you know, has wildfire concerns. You know, where I'm at here in Maryland, it's, it's not an issue, but if you live in a part of the country where wildfires are a big deal, it's a real big deal. And, and uh, the utilities working on this are, are, are open to and interested in every tool they can get their hand on and, and help with how they pull different pieces of information together. You know, Joe mentioned uh, about things that you can do with transient disturbances. There's a lot that can be done there. Now, you know, when, when um, the utility has devices that are picking up some of the transient disturbances, you know, in most places, they won't want to run out there and, and investigate every one of those necessarily. But if you are one of those uh, utilities who has a wildfire risk, you're picking up those things from part of your network that's in a uh, high fire threat district. Um, and it's that time of year, you're going to go out there and investigate. And, and some of these utilities are taking data from different sources, whether it's from their smart meters, from other intelligent devices along the distribution network to sources that they have at the substation. They're using those multiple sources to try to triangulate and, and get better and better at identifying right, where can we go to investigate um, and, and get a good outcome and avoid uh, problems. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. Sometimes when, when there's a fault that's happened, a crew goes out there, and uh, when the lights are off, they will find the tree branch that, that took out, you know, a wire somewhere. But when it's a transient thing, it's now you see it, now you don't. And you tell a crew you member to go out there on something that may have been a tree branch, uh, slapping the line when it was windy, and now it's not. How's he going to find that? Uh, when it's something that's, you know, cracked insulator, um, shorting windings in, in a piece of equipment, that if it if it festers and it's not addressed, it could become the next you know wildfire. Um, yes. And so the better that that they can have multiple tools and triangulate and tell them where to go look and what they might be looking for, um, that that's going to just really make it uh, a, a more successful outcome for them. But then that's going to translate to other utilities that maybe don't have wildfire concerns. These proactive tools and solutions and all this data coming together with the appropriate analytics is going to benefit all the utilities that have an interest purely from a, uh, a reliability uh, perspective. And then other, other things that are going on have to do with you know, different forms of, of automation. Um, you know, utilities need this data in their SCADA systems and more and more in their uh, advanced uh, distribution management systems. And uh, for applications such as as Flister or just better power flow modeling of, of their network, uh, and with you know reliable you know, Flister applications, and they know you know where the faults are happening and what the power flow is in other segments, they can more uh, optimally you know switch the network and, and get the lights back on to other people that don't have to be affected uh, more more quickly. Uh, in terms of, of you know. Improving the 
optimal operation of, of the network. Um, you know, a lot of utilities are, are looking at doing more with capacitor banks, but sometimes they don't know where they need them, how many K bars they need, and, and getting them some tools to help do some of that planning exercise. It also comes into play a great deal with uh, uh, integration of more uh, renewables and DERs. Um, there's, there's a push to, to go fast by uh, customers and regulators and, and giving the, those planners the, the reliable, detailed information to do their planning exercises more quickly is critical. And then once you've brought some of these things online, uh, it really changes the way that the, uh, the networks are, are operating. And, and you need that good visibility to, uh, to, to keep managing it. We, we've talked to customers that um, um, have been adding more distributed generation in the networks. They, um, they know they need visibility at certain places, but they, they think they're good on other places. Well, you've got um, more renewable power on the, on the network and you've got bi-directional flow of power. And we've had utilities tell us they were supremely confident, you know, what their, uh, their power flows were at the substation. And, but when they, they looked at it in more detail, they've got reverse power flow going backwards through the substation and they just didn't realize it. They thought they had good SCADA monitoring there, but it was actually kind of out of date uh, in terms of the, the gear that they had. And, and they were running a little bit blind to the fact that they have reverse power flow all the way back through their, their substation. So um, you need to, to be able to, you know, not only add where you know you don't have visibility, you need to kind of double check who you think you have visibility and make sure you're getting the right information. So, um, Joe, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you, but let me let me just say because uh, you know I think there's a thread here I've heard right situational awareness, asset visibility, training staff, workforce development. You know, Kevin, you you hit on some really great topics. You know, having the ability to 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 make sense of data with analytics so that maybe it it doesn't mean somebody's driving out to a substation, the information comes. And for our utility operators, we understand that SCADA and OT and the, the dials and the lights and things that you monitor, it works. At the end of the day though, you know, keeping the grid up is important, but knowing how to be proactive and be prescriptive of what could happen due to an environmental impact, tornadoes, wildfires, pick a part of the country, stuff happens in every place. I mean, we had an earthquake twice here in Washington, D.C., which was crazy many, many moons ago, and I was downtown in the building, having situational awareness so that the end of life of, com of, of equipment, which was brought up by Ron, uh, just because it works doesn't mean it shouldn't be replaced. And I think uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, doesn't always apply when it comes to we could be better at that situation awareness. So Kevin, thank you and for emphasizing the, the efforts that we have to put into, again, with a collaborative community like the AEP, to kind of talk about what capabilities companies like yours have that could be taken advantage of and shout out, you know, Dan Terex again for kind of being that integrator of sorts to help say, hey, you know, uh, we're putting it out there, but but every company has a unique capability. Uh, Joe, comments. So from the Ubiquia perspective, uh, we kind of see, you know, the team is spot on, right? So it has to be for, for our lens, we're really focused on easy to deploy intelligent infrastructure platforms that have to come at scale given this, the vast nature of the grid, right? So we want, that's kind of our, our mantra, right? Our ubiquitous intelligent infrastructure platforms, they, all of our platforms install in minutes, they're easy to connect, you know, they're riding on, you know, LTE, public, private, doesn't matter. Um, but it's that scalability that we think is critical. Right. While we understand the importance of transmission and substation, uh, right now most of the outages are occurring on the distribution side of the house. So we tend to focus more on that side of, of the grid, where we're seeing um, smart grid products attaching to existing uh, equipment, whether a pole, whether a transformer, whether a cap bank, and then having that smart infrastructure provide the information needed. So some of that means we're gonna do some smart edge computing, right? We don't necessarily, well, we need to have all the information that we can to make smart decisions. That might mean sampling at a thousand times per cycle. You know, that's more bandwidth than a lot of video streaming. 
that's just not sustainable for thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of, of edge devices. So what you wanna do when you can is do some, some edge processing. When you absolutely need to bring the information back, you want it to be as low bandwidth as possible, but still have the data fidelity you need to make the right decisions. Sometimes that means I just need you know a yes or no, I'm open or closed, but sometimes it means I need to look at this complicated waveform because it's, it's anomalous to what my machine learning algorithms have done in the past, and this one is different and unique, please send that over to me. And when you have all that information, how do I leverage it? Who does it go to? Some information is, is kind of analytics based. I'm gonna make some long-term decisions with that. I'm gonna train my machine models with that. But some of it is somebody just hit a pole with a truck and the truck's on the ground, uh, the pole's on the ground. You need to send somebody out there down. So we touched on it a little bit on the past about IT, OT integration. Where does some of this go? How to bifurcate the data so the folks that need the real-time information can take it and utilize it and the folks that are building those, those learning algorithms, the long-term planning, uh, can use that information. I think uh, one of our panelists mentioned it earlier, or both of them, I think, where we have the EV deployment, the, uh, the folks that are, are deploying uh, grids, solar, uh, this changes the grid dynamics 100%. You're used to uh, grid planners that are creating a one-way grid, and that one-way grid has been installed and deployed for the last hundred years. You know, now all of a sudden, in a very short time, that same grid that was design designed for that one-way operation has to operate going two ways. And if you don't know where the culprit is, you know, is it is it the set the ten homes on the cul-de-sac that that have the the EV chargers that are are dragging the voltage down, or is it the other neighborhood over that has uh, solar panels to, to deployed across the entire uh, the, the entire street and these guys are the ones that are pumping harmonics and and changing the the current flow back to the utility and then tying all that stuff back in how do we how do we then utilize that information or give it to the right decision makers so that during these extreme weather events right when it, it, there's an ice storm in Texas you know that uh, you know the the elderly lady who's trying to turn on her heat is not being you know getting short changed by the folks around the corner who are try trying to charge their their you know 10 large evs that are not going to go anywhere because there's ice on the ground so so kind of putting all that together where to island where not to island where to do grid forming where to do you know following all of that information really in our belief it requires a lot more sensors requires a lot more data and a lot of that needs to be distributed out to the grid uh, from our lens so fellas now we're going to do a quick fire because i have a new question but i want to put it out there given the theme this week of collaboration and 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 talking and you know the aaep being that 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 nexus for wisdom collective wisdom to talk about challenges and opportunities um, before we get to parting shots, which is one of my favorite piece, and you could be thinking about it, the word grid dynamics has come up a few times, situational awareness. It's a changing grid, we get it. A, a theme that's come up this week is resilience and redundancy and restoration. Private LTE, private wireless, broadband. Ron, is that a key ingredient to a resilient grid? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, I, when you think about it, Tying it back to step one is always about network visibility. And in order to have network visibility to enable any of these capabilities, you have to have a resilient, reliable core of communications, right? And certainly LTE has the capabilities throughout to support all types of redundancies. Um, and you know, one of the one of the big benefits is, you know, we've got over a billion users of LTE across the world, not in a uh, utility standpoint, but collectively from a mobile device standpoint. So from a standardization perspective, it's rock solid. From a capabilities in terms of how you manage and deploy networks, there's lots of different ways to optimize networks, mobility, non-mobility. Most of our applications in the utility world are non-mobility based. And you know all of those tools and techniques have been honed over the last 30 years. So the, the great news for the utility industry is you can leverage all those learnings that the, the cellular world 
has had over the last 30 years. So absolutely, it's fundamentally important. It's the, it's the core, it's the key to getting this off the ground. Appreciate that. Kevin, thoughts on private LTE? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, it, it's core to everything we've been talking about right now, um, especially if you were to go to the, uh, the UBBA conference, um, it, you know, and, and Terex is, is one of the key you know, members there. Uh, but utilities that will speak at the conference, they'll talk about several things. They need a flexibility of a variety of, of solutions. It'll include private wireless, uh, public cellular, private LTE, fiber, uh, a range of different things. But important to all of that is they need to have um, some control to ensure that that is reliable. If they don't have those communications networks always up, given that visibility, that's a big risk for that. So uh, the, the capabilities that private LTE solutions provide, uh, the low latency and the reliability, bandwidth of it, uh, are, are core to some of the things we talked about. Thank you, Kevin. Joe? Absolutely. Uh, you know, think of the, the bandwidth utilization we're all talking about. If we want to make the, you know, distribution smart grid of the future, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of sensors out there. The mechanism for communication has to be rock solid. It has to have low latency. It has to be up and available. And, you know, some of the more traditional communications systems just don't have it, right? We're talking about more data, more nodes, more equipment. You know, it, you absolutely need to have something like, you know, LTE, private LTE, fiber backhaul in order to make all this work or else you know, what we're talking about isn't gonna be scalable. All right, great, great, great. Okay, no, wonderful. Flexibility, operational efficiency, thank you, thank you. I just think that's a theme that, that is, it's, there's many solutions, but it starts with look at the world we're living in and the type of grid that we have. So thank you for that, that quick fire. Okay, parting shot se segment, 45 seconds or less or so. We've said a lot, now's the chance to say a little less and in a concise manner. What do you want to leave with the audience? What'd you glean from today? What was your light bulb moment? Ron. So first of all, Pete, thanks for guiding us through this riff. It's been uh, it's been a, a pleasure to be part of it. And congratulations to Enteric's Active Active Ecosystem for two years. Time time flies by. I, th I think the biggest thing is there's certainly a lot of collaboration. There's uh, we're at an opportunity and an inflection point in the industry where a lot of changes are going to occur. And listening to this entire conversation, not only Hitachi Energy but Hubble and Eclara and the Ubiquia, there are solutions that are out there. So I think from a utility perspective, it's a great time to invest in the next generation of technologies to optimize how you run your grid. Love it. Thank you, Ron. Joe. So I think my parting shot's going to be, this is a journey. It's absolutely a journey. It's a journey that's going to be tough. It needs visionaries to take that first step. But we firmly believe that that first step is is going to lead to lots of easy ROIs up front, right? When you start deploying, you know, you'll be able to easily do that. Um, and so the initial step you know, for deployment with the right vision is key to making this happen. And, you know, so the sooner a lot of these utilities can start those journeys that haven't started it already, uh, the better. And for those that have started it, you know, please share it with the others that haven't so that they can see the promise that uh, a lot of the technology that we've talked about today can deliver. Thank you, Joe. Kevin, close us out. Thank you, Pete. I appreciate uh, your leadership in this. And uh, thank you to Enterix for uh, inviting me uh, to participate in the panel. Um, uh, my, my view is that uh, there's a lot of opportunity for utilities today, especially with all of the uh, the government funding available. I really hope that a lot of utilities are looking at how they can take advantage of that and, and working with all of us and, and other suppliers at how best to take advantage of it. But uh, we really believe that uh, reliable, real-time communications is a fundamental thing, getting visibility, and it's going to enable a much greater degree of, of um, automation, reliability, resiliency, and more optimally operating the networks. And it's going to make the networks safer also for uh, their end customers as well. 
Well, I'm going to close it out with a shout out to each of you. Wonderful thought leadership, amazing, insightful content. What vision you each have, and I can feel the passion. Keep doing what you do. I'm honored to know you, and I, I hope we have a chance to meet again. Shout out to Anterix, of course. What a week to celebrate a collaborative community known as the AAEP. Uh, if you weren't able to or want to see replays of these, you can absolutely catch each of these episodes uh, in the coming days. But uh, with that, I will close with you. Educated, informed, and enlightened, I hope and I believe our audience. You all are amazing, and thank you, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.